I am Sisego Kumalo, your host and a visiting fellow of the Harvard South African Fellowship Program, as well as a lecturer of philosophy at the University of Fort Hare in South Africa, where I teach on social and political philosophy, feminist and queer theory, decoloniality, and the Black Archive. Today, I am joined by the distinguished, kind, and incredibly generous Professor Paul Tiambe Zaleza, my senior in all meanings of the term. Paul currently serves as Associate Provost at the North Star and the North Star Distinguished Professor at Case Western Reserve University, a leading American research university. His immediate past appointment was at the United States International University Africa in Nairobi, Kenya, where he served as Vice Chancellor and President. And, and what it does underscore is what Huntonji talked about a long time. Mm. It's the extravasion yes. of our epistemic practices. Um, so, uh, which is a replica of the extravasion of our economies. Mm. They're very outwardly focused in which intra-African trade, and in this case, intra-African intellectual production, mm -hmm. uh, is much less than the extra-continental intellectual collaborations and the extra-continental economic mm. engagements. Thinking, and suddenly now I'm like, I do write poetry. Wait, mm -hmm. I am a poet, mm -hmm. right? Like, and I think there are things that I couldn't claim before because I was also denying the people that I come from who they fully are. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that really becomes the, the danger of not knowing enough about the knowledge systems of where we come from. Which is to say, the ideological horizon of the present. And that to me is what is, is sort of the distinction. I think there, there is a way in which one can have a kind of crude um, uh, instrumentalization of art for political purposes, which is never very interesting. Yeah. But that's also often easily detected. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I, I always wonder why people get so exercised about that as if 99% of people all the time can't tell that mm -hmm. that's happening and either approve of it or don't. Mm -hmm. But it's not that interesting a question. Mm -hmm. In the writing of art historians, particularly white ones, they centralize their own voice rather than the voice of the person they are speaking to or speaking about. Mm -hmm. And it's that simple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is your voice that overshadows what the work is about. You centralize yourself in the narrative of speaking about something that you do not, mm -hmm. in any shadow of a doubt, have any experience in living. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You are not interested or curious enough about the languages in which the work is coming from the environment. But the point is this sets up the scene for the invasion and what happens during the invasion. Now, many Nigerians refer to this as the Anglo-Benin War. Mm -hmm. They never refer to it as the British Expedition mm -hmm. unless they've sort of, you know, done some work in Britain or, you know, with um, sort of Western sources. Prim primarily, when I see Nigerian historians talking about this event, they talk about it as the Anglo-Benin War, which has a completely different ring to it mm -hmm. than an expedition, mm -hmm. right? It is called a war. Mm -hmm. War gives agency to both parties. Mm -hmm. They speak about the Benin Kingdom as fighting bravely, mm -hmm. you know, majestically. Like, they, they, they build up the oral history yeah. of the Benin Kingdom, which we don't see in the the written different historical written accounts. historical accounts that we yeah. get. This monolingualism has not gifted us anything. Mm. It took something away from us and replaced it with this single unit, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I want to talk about what it does when we shift the paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, I have been on a number of panels where people have spoken about what is your literary heritage okay. in Europe? What I realize is that when people ask you that, what they are saying is, how are you like us? Okay. So, okay. what I've been doing is I disrupt that and I say, well, um, my heritage is Kwekwanasi, is Ga Kbamo, is Asante Proverbs. And then suddenly, the people I'm on a panel with, who would have thought themselves to be authorities, are suddenly uncomfortable. That discomfort is precisely why we need to be having these conversations. Because it tells you that people have, who have been parading as though they have the knowledge of the world don't have the knowledge of the world. Because quite frankly, I could talk their language. I've just shifted, I've just given them a little, you know, faint. Yes. And they're lost. Yes. Uh, 
but to rebuild people is to rebuild their identity. Yes. It's like a national identity. So how do we use the past? How do we use what have been left, like uh, even paintings, mm -hmm. even, you know, drawings, even uh, music, drums, etc., to give a new identity? Uh, not in opposition with the Western countries or yes. Western culture, but, but how, who are we, who are we, yes. who are yes. we, who are you? And I'm curious then, which maybe is to say, going back to the previous question, mm. do we not sometimes hold linguists back as, as philosophers with the kind of work that we do with language and how we understand, classify and categorize language? No, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. They say there's a time people did not come to schools like this one until they have, have finished their planting their crops. And now they have all these whole season and they'll be winter and all day, then they can go and do these things. These things were made the way they operate. Mm -hmm. According to people's traditions and the circumstances they were in, they were not a fashion this way. So when we talk about imagining it, it is really, we have to go to the curriculum. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not anything else. And for me, it is, sometimes we are called to reimagine things. And that might not require reimagining? That, that we are being given a task. We are, you, remember, you have to remember, we Africans are given, we are thrown problems, enigmas, that we are actually trying to solve over there. And before we know it, time has gone. We actually looked away. And intervention points uh, called courses mm -hmm. and other kinds of extracurricular activities and academic learning that happens outside the classroom. So it's a very unique environment. Um, but I think if we see the university primarily as a, as a democratic project, not as a business. Of course, it's business principles apply to various ways that universities run, but I think the primary role of a university is not uh, to, to be a business and to make money. It is to be a place of democratic uh, aspiration, meeting the intellectual uh, ideals that you have for um, extending and innovating and experimenting with truth and knowledge uh, in ways that um, allow us to, to imagine new futures, um, to imagine new societies, and to, to think about how we, um, you know, can, can, can live together. Do we change it so that we will be better prepared to get into the elite universities? Or do we want to have this uh, synergy between changing what's expected at the university level that then can allow the R through 12 system be a little bit more creative, be a little bit, be different, mm -hmm. and be more equitable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any, anyone with a, with a platform is a leader. Nowadays, mm -hmm. if you have 100 followers on your Facebook page or on your Instagram page, you are a leader because what's the opposite of a leader? Mm -hmm. A follower. Mm -hmm. And guess what we all are trying to get nowadays? More what? More followers. <laughs> So, why, yeah, so, why, so yeah. why are you trying to get more followers, but you're not going to lead? 